Welcome everyone and welcome to this clinic update from SGO 2023 on PARP inhibitor in ovarian cancer. My name is Domenica Luruso. I am an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Fondazione Policlinico Universitario Gemelli in Rome, Italy. I have the great pleasure to be here with Professor Frederick Marm, Assistant Professor of Gynecology for the Medical Faculty at the University of Heidelberg in Germany, and Dr. Susanna Banerjee, Consultant Medical Oncology at the Royal Marsden Foundation Trust in London, UK. Today, we will be sharing our interpretation of data from the SGO Congress 2023 on PARP inhibitor in ovarian cancer and what they may mean for our clinical practice. Our agenda is very rich. We have three different parts. The first is dedicated to the update on first-line PARP maintenance in ovarian cancer. Where are we now? The second part is dedicated to the selection and sequencing implication for PARP in ovarian cancer emerging from the latest data. What should we consider and when? And the third part is dedicated to the emerging PARP-based new adjuvant and combination regimen in ovarian cancer. Where are we heading? And now let's start with the first part on the update on first-line PARP maintenance in ovarian cancer. Where are we now? As you know, ovarian cancer is a clinically aggressive disease. And more than 80% of patients are diagnosed at stage 3 and 4. And the, the five-year overall survival for our patient is about 40%. And this situation is quite unchanged in the last 20 years. It is the tumor with the higher mortality among the gynecological tumor. Basically, what we know is that after the first diagnosis, the first surgery and the first line chemo, more than 80% of our patients will experience recurrence of disease during the first three years. So we dedicated the, the last 20 years on clinical research in the identification of maintenance treatment. I mean, something able to prolong the benefit of surgery and chemotherapy, potentially to improve survival at the price of a good toxicity profile for our patient. The most important step forward in the management of ovarian cancer occur when we realize ovarian cancer is not a single disease, but at least five different tumors, and in particular, high-grade serious and high-grade endometrioid ovarian cancer present in 25% of cases a somatic of germline BRCA mutation, and in additional 25% of patients, there is a deficit in the homologous recombination. In this scenario, PARP inhibitor play the major role in maintenance treatment. And in the last four to five years, we have at least three to four randomized trials in first line setting reporting consistently a benefit in terms of progression free survival when PARP inhibitor were given as maintenance treatment in patients with complete or partial response to first line platinum based chemotherapy, regardless BRCA mutation. At this SGO, we saw the long-term follow-up of SOLO1 data. SOLO1 was the randomized trial using Olaparib as maintenance treatment in FIGO stage 3-4 BRCA mute high-grade serious or endometrioid ovarian cancer patient. This patient received platinum-based chemotherapy, and if they achieve a complete or partial response at the end of chemo, were are randomized to receive Olaparib for two years or placebo. Here, we reported the, the seven-year overall survival descriptive analysis. This is a seminal overall survival analysis because the events are not yet mature. And in this analysis, we confirmed that the two-year maintenance with Olaparib in BRCA mute patient translate in an ration of O55 for median PFS and also for OS. In particular, median overall survival was not 
reached in patients receiving olaparib versus 75 months in patients receiving placebo. And this extraordinary results was achieved even though 44% of patients in the placebo group receive a subsequent PARP inhibitor at the time of progression, and 14% patient in olaparib group receive an additional PARP inhibitor at the time of progression. And more interesting, time to first subsequent therapy was a significantly increase in patients receiving olaparib, which is of almost important for our patient to avoid or delayed subsequent chemo. An important topic is that most of PARP inhibitors have a, a kind of interference with the cytochrome P450 because they have an hepatic liver metabolism. So in this retrospective study presented at SGO, the, the authors tried to quantify the proportion of patients with ovarian cancer receiving a cytochrome P450 modulating medication and what kind of what percentage of this patient is also eligible for PARP therapy in first line setting. And it was quite interesting because they analyzed a huge number of patients, 1,400 patients. And of this patient, 158 were in treatment with PARP inhibitor, but potentially 1,200 were potentially eligible for PARP inhibitor treatment. So a huge number of patients potentially. And it is important to know that in the total PARP cohort treated patient, the blue line, about 40% of patients receive medication interfering with the cytochrome. And in the general potentially eligible population, 33% of patients potentially receive this kind of drug. The most frequently used drug interfering with the cytochrome were antiemetics followed by antibiotics. But it is important to, to stress this point because many patients with advanced ovarian cancer receive strong or moderate cytochrome interfering medication, which could increase the risk of toxicity when using PARP inhibitor and potentially also PARP efficacy. So this is a, a point that should be addressed in our clinical practice. Another important topic when we use PARP inhibitor is the appropriate dose. You know that niraparib has been initially commercialized at the dose of 300 milligram once daily, but according to a retrospective analysis in NOVA trial, which suggests that patients with weighting less than 77 kilos or with less than 100 1,500 platelet should receive 200 milligram because 300 is a very high dose. This is a process that we usually now in our clinical practice, which is the individualized dose according to patient characteristic. But there is a main topic. Is the reduced individualized dose as effective as the full dose? At SGO, we presented a postdoc analysis of the PRIME trial using uh, niraparib in the maintenance setting of newly diagnosed stage 3-4 ovarian cancer patient. The trial used the individualized dose with the 200 of 300 milligram according to patient characteristic in terms of number of platelet and body weight. And regardless the starting dose, some patients still require dose reduction. It was very interesting to know that uh, even in patients who, who require the dose reduction due to treatment emergent adverse event, this dose reduction does not seem to impact on the efficacy of niraparib in this patient with the newly diagnosed ovarian cancer because the median progression free survival was comparable regardless BRCA mutation and regardless the dose reduction. This is quite comfortable for us and for our patient. The adaptation of the dose does not seem to impact on the efficacy. 
And another very important uh, topic uh, that we need to address in the counseling with our patient is uh, what is our inpatient expectation of efficacy? And in other words, what are the risk factors that in such a way can anticipate the failure of PARP maintenance therapy? This is a multi-center uh, retrospective study presented at SGO in which uh, uh, a group of uh, patients with high-grade serious tumor, but not, not only, there were also clear cell and endometroid patients. 63% of patients presented BRCA mutation, and they have received primary surgery in 60% of cases, new adjuvant chemo in 37% of patients, and there were a, a small cohort of patients never operated. The author addressed which were the risk factor for PARP failure. And it was interesting to know that in patients with BRCA mute, the level of CA125 at the time of starting of maintenance therapy with PARP inhibitor may impact on the efficacy of PARP. And the other ratio was doubled for progression in patients with CA125 more than 26 with respect to patients with the lower value. In patients without BRCA mute, the histology of the tumor play a major role and high-grade serious tumor respond better to PARP inhibitor and have a significantly increased progression-free survival with respect to non-high-grade serious tumor, but also the type of surgery primary surgery with respect to new adjuvant chemotherapy is a prognostic factor also for the response to PARP inhibitor. So in conclusion, in this uh, uh, pre-PARP, uh, in this PARP-treated population, high pre-PARP serum CA125, no high-grade serious histology and uh, no BRCA mutation may increase the risk of failure of PARP inhibitor. And this concludes my overview of some of the latest clinical data that were presented at SGO in first-line setting. And it's my pleasure now to invite uh, Professor Frederick Marm and uh, Dr. Susanna Banerjee to join uh, with me the discussion. And uh, in particular, I want to ask uh, Susanna, in your opinion, what is the clinical impact on this data in our clinical practice? I think the key take-home message, and which is reassuring, is that there is long-term benefits for patients with BRCA mutations receiving first-line maintenance PARP inhibitors. So it reiterates the practice to offer patients PARP inhibitors in the first-line setting. And we heard the SOLO1 data um, also at um, Seven Year Survival at um, the ESMO Congress in 2022. So I think um, this, this reiterates the importance of long-term follow-up. Um, and now we have the potential to have more women in remission and potentially cured. The other important point was um, the um, uh, effects of dose modifications um, reported in the PRIME study with niraparib. And it was reassuring to hear that the clinical efficacy didn't appear to be compromised with dose modifications. So really helpful when we're counseling our patients in clinic. Thank you, Susanna. Frederick, in your opinion, what this data change in your clinical practice? I think it does really confirm our practice and maybe sort of underlines the importance of giving PARP inhibitors first line, because I think Two, two aspects are, are really, really impressive. One of them is that if you look at the SOLO1 data, um, Olaprib was given for two years mostly. And uh, we have we have seen a median follow-up of seven years now. So there's two years on treatment and five years without it. We see a huge difference. And more than more than half of the patients were still alive on Olaprib. Uh, with a great difference to the uh, control arm. And this is despite uh, almost half of the patients receiving a PARP inhibitor along the lines during their, their, their subsequent lines of therapy. So what you gain there, you cannot make up for during the subsequent lines. I think this is really important. Also, 
um, you know, there weren't any new safety signals in terms of MDS, AML. So the, the more serious side effects that we fear, if we use PARP inhibitors first line for defined period of time in relatively uh, little pretreated uh, patients in that setting. So that's very reassuring. And I think there is no way around it. If you want to use PARP inhibitors and for BRCA positive, Asia D positive, the, this, is, this is such a strong rationale that this is clearly the standard of care. You should do it in the first line setting. And you know all the things that we need to to consider about um, side effect and, and therapy management. They're all very important. The study on the um, CYP um, enzymes really showed that we need to be aware of the co medications. Um, reassuring, reassuringly, also many of these medications are short term medications. So if you have to give them, you know, like antibiotics, that's not something that you give on the long run you can pause maybe, or, you know, the, the PARP inhibitor, but also that should be what you th should think about. I think antiemetics are usually given because of the PARP inhibitors. So we should be really cautious if we choose to give antiemetics anti to, um, to al alleviate the side effects of some of the PARP inhibitors, that we should choose something that does not actually interfere with uh, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. I, I fully agree with you and Susie. Uh, the, these data are, are really strong and confirmatory on the necessity to use PARP inhibitor in first line. The dose adaptation seems to be quite sure and uh, not detrimental in efficacy. For sure, we need to be conscious uh, of potential interaction with the, the other drug. Uh, Susie, a comment on the last topic, uh, primary surgery and the reduced CA125 is a predictive biomarker of prolonged um, efficacy of PARP inhibitor apparently in this retrospective analysis. Uh, this push more and more versus primary surgery with respect to new value and chemo. I think firstly, it's important to point out um, that, that this is very intriguing data. It's interesting. It's the value of retrospective series, but it is a retrospective series. So we also need to look at the um, uh, prospective phase three clinical trials. Um, and the take home message there is that all the subgroups did benefit compared to placebo with the addition of a PARP inhibitor. Um, but I think for an individual patient, if it's possible and feasible to have upfront surgery, that is our preference. Um, so that wouldn't change my clinical practice. Um, and uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is reserved where primary um, uh, complete cytoreduction is unlikely. Um, so, and the CA125 uh, data, again, um, intriguing, um, looking at the actual level of CA125. I think we need more data and also it'd be good to look at this in the prospective clinical trials and look at this retrospectively um, to see um, if the same message is, is, is being seen. Um, but again, it shows the value um, of uh, looking at retrospective series and clinical practice. Thank you, Susie. And thank you, Frederick. It was really a great discussion. And thank you and uh, see you soon for other discussion. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Dr. Susanna Banerjee. I'm a consultant medical oncologist at the Royal Marsden NHS Foundation Trust in London, UK. So in this second section, we'll be considering um, selection and sequencing implications for PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer, um, emerging from the latest data that was presented at SGO in 2023. So what should we consider and when? So in the last presentation um, from Professor LaRusso, uh, we heard um, from herself and also in the panel discussion how important it is to consider PARP inhibitors as first-line maintenance therapy. And that's based on the SOLO-1 study of Alaparib, Prima of Niraparib, Paolo-1, Alaparib and Bevacizumab, and also um, in line with the results that are presented from the other PARP inhibitors, the Athena Mono with Rucaparib. Um, and what we're going to also recognize is that 
for newly diagnosed patients will be considering first line PARP inhibitors. But there are patients um, that may not have received first line PARP inhibitors so far. And therefore, it's very important to not forget the um, results uh, and long term follow ups of the studies of PARP inhibitors in recurrent ovarian cancer, where PARP inhibitors um, received their initial approvals. Um, and also, we need to learn how um, do we identify any subgroups that we see in our clinical practice where we need some more information. And that's what's going to come up in the next few presentations. So when we select um, uh, patients for consideration of PARP inhibitors, it's important to think about the long-term picture, thinking about sequencing and the implications of sequencing therapies. We look at a number of factors. So the molecular status, BRCA mutations, the HRD status, and also more recently considering if we can um, uh, BRCA reversions. There's also clinical factors such as comorbidities, staging of the patients at diagnosis, prior therapies, surgical outcome, um, timing, site of recurrence, and are there other treatment options, as well as um, specific considerations, for example, convenience of delivery of treatment, patient's preference, if there are other treatment options, clinical trials, for example, and importantly, adverse effect profiles um, and long-term implications. So the first um, abstract and presentation I'm going to highlight is an oral presentation from Matalonis and colleagues looking at the final overall survival from NGOT OV16, the NOVA study of nirapirib in platinum-sensitive uh, recurrent ovarian cancer as maintenance therapy. Now, the um, pre-planned overall survival analysis um, was um, presented at SGO in 2021, but there were some aspects, for example, the amount of missing survival um, data that meant it was important, um, as recommended by the FDA, to have a further data retrieval um, uh, attempting to improve the amount of data we had on long-term follow-up. Um, and so in terms of survival status, that um, uh, improved from 17% missing to 2% and over 97% in this analysis um, had the overall survival um, follow up. So just to remind you, the primary endpoint was progression free survival. Overall survival was a secondary endpoint, along with other key um, clinically relevant secondary endpoints. Um, and there was an exploratory analysis here of the non G BRCA mutated cohort according to HRD status. So, what we heard um, at SGO 2023 was that um, um, the hazard ratio for patients with germline BRCA mutation status was 0.85. Um, in the non G BRCA status, it was 1.06. And then in the exploratory analysis by HRD subgroup, um, in HRD positive, it was 1.29, um, HRD um, um, negative, uh, 0.93, and the HRD not known, 0.62. So what's clear is that these confidence intervals are large and overlap, um, and this is an exploratory um, analysis. But there were key secondary efficacy endpoints, such as um, time to um, subsequent therapy, time to first subsequent therapy, time to second subsequent therapy, and progression for survival, um, progression free survival too, which demonstrated um, uh, an ongoing treatment effect in favor of niraparib in both the G BRCA and the non G BRCA cohorts. Importantly, there were no new safety signals here, and the overall incidence of MDS and AML was 3.8% versus 1.7 in the niraparib versus placebo arms. So I think it's important to acknowledge that there was subsequent PARP inhibitor therapy that can confound and other post-progression therapies. Um, but I think this was a very important analysis and um, uh, presentation at SGO 2023. Now, the remaining um, abstracts that we're gonna discuss um, are posters that were presented at SGO in relation to PARP inhibitor use um, or relevant to PARP inhibitor use, such as genetic testing as well. And these are um, a retrospective series, and it really shows um, how 
um, it can be important and food for thought in, in looking at our retrospective experience um, for important questions to try and address um, in clinical practice and also an area that should be looked at um, potentially in subsequent trials. So the first abstract by Jan et al. Um, was looking at PARP inhibitor use after PARP inhibitors in patients with a recurrent ovarian cancer. So of course, there's the OREO study um, that I'm sure we'll discuss with the panelists. Um, and this study was looking at um, a real world experience um, uh, from a group in China. Um, they had 49 patients uh, with recurrent disease um, that received um, two or more lines of um, PARP inhibitor therapy. So within that group of 49 patients, around half had BRCA mutations. Um, over 60% had um, two lines of PARP inhibitor maintenance therapy, um, and around 28% had one line of PARP inhibitor maintenance um, therapy. So what the authors um, presented was that the median duration of treatment um, unsurprisingly, in light of data that we know from OREO and other studies, that the time um, for, of duration of PARP inhibitors um, for the first treatment was longer than when treated subsequently with a PARP inhibitor. And in this series, it was 11.2 and then um, just over four months. So then the group um, looked uh, at um, um, time to next treatment. Uh, according to BRCA mutation status, and the time to next treatment was longer um, in those patients that had a BRCA mutation in this series than those that didn't. And interestingly, they also looked according to the response to previous chemotherapy. Um, and what was clear is that those that had um, a complete response to the prior chemotherapy had a longer time to next subsequent therapy um, with, the, with the PARP inhibitor. Um, and that was um, uh, longer in patients with a complete response rather than a partial response. Um, and so these are potential factors that we may be considering in clinical practice if we're um, able to give um, subsequent PARP inhibitors and importantly may direct clinical trials going forward. So, and then um, looking at um, um, some real world data into genetic testing, um, this was a US um, study that I'm going to talk about now, Folsom et al, uh, which looked at the experience from Pittsburgh, looking at um, uh, um, uh, testing um, in 2018, and then um, 2019 to 2021, when effectively first line maintenance PARP inhibitors entered the practice arena. What I'd like to highlight in this study is that around 35% had stage one or stage two disease, the remainder had advanced disease, and around 60% had serous um, ovarian cancer. And what the team reported was that um, germline testing um, increased generally um, as a trend over time um, from around 49%, then going above 50%. And tumor testing in 2018 was around 20%, and then peaked to 41% um, in 2020. Um, what was also of note is that there was a shorter time to testing now, um, which reflects, I hope, the education of the, the, the value of germline and tumor testing. So germline testing was around 20 months in 2018 versus around seven months in the latter cohort, for example. But what is clear is that despite improvements in the um, time to testing, there still appears too many patients, um, so over 50%, that are not having testing, germline or tumor testing. Um, and that was one of the conclusions of the authors. But I think it's important to also acknowledge which patients are offered testing, because as I said, um, around 35% um, did have um, uh, early stage disease, um, so stage one or stage two disease. So finally, um, um, I'd like to end with the abstract by Dottina et al., which is, again, is a U.S. real world data study looking at access um, to PARP inhibitors or attempting to look at various factors um, uh, which may influence this. So this looked at over 12,000 patients looking at commercial insurance and Medicare um, claims database for women diagnosed with ovarian cancer from 2015 to 2021. 
Um, and thinking about approvals at that point, um, 2015 to, um, to 16 with the recurrent disease, and then the latter group, um, 2017 or 18 to 2021, would have been um, uh, more access um, in the US to PARP inhibitors, for example, in the first line setting. So what the authors concluded was that um, the um, uh, more women were receiving PARP inhibitors earlier on, um, post the, uh, diagnosis of ovarian cancer, and the, and the proportion of patients receiving a PARP inhibitor was 7.3% in the initial 2015 to 16, and then 10.6% um, in 2017 to 21. Um, what they saw was that um, uh, in their analyses that patients that had older age and lower education, um, these factors were associated with a lower likelihood for receiving PARP inhibitors. And these are important points when we're looking at our own countries and our own hospitals and institutions. Um, but also what was quite surprising, I would say, um, was that the percentage of patients receiving PARP inhibitors um, I appreciate that's increased to 10%. Um, and it's really important to look at real world data from other um, countries as well. But I would hope with the um, first line PARP inhibitor data and results that we've discussed um, in this um, forum today, um, that more women are uh, being offered and receiving PARP inhibitors. And I'd like to open the discussion to our panel. So our co-faculty, Dr. Keta LaRusso, um, Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, in Rome, Italy, and Professor Frederick Marme, Associate Professor of Gynecology from Heidelberg, Germany. So um, what I'd like to do is um, um, uh, target our discussion because they're uh, varied um, abstracts, um, albeit all about PARP inhibitors or, or genetic testing. My first question to you both, and I'll start with Professor LaRusso, um, is how does the NOVA um, uh, data presented by Matalonis et al, um, uh, what are your take on that? How does that affect your decision making? And I'll ask the same question if you could please follow Professor Malme. Susie, thank you for this very important question. But my answer is very simple. This data will not impact my clinical practice. I do not expect an overall survival advantage in a trial which was not powered to detect an overall survival in a population with a long post-progression survival, which receive a huge number of post-PARP therapy that impact on the possibility to detect an overall survival. In a trial in which 45% of patients take at a crossover after progression, so the huge number of crossover impact on the possibility to detect overall survival. I'm not surprised that we do not have overall survival benefit in this situation. This is the reason why this data will not impact. The primary point of the trial was progression-free survival. The trial was powered for progression free survival. The advantage in progression-free survival was statistically significant and clinically meaningful, and I will use PARP according to this primary endpoint which was reached. Again, I think that PARP inhibitors are a drug for first line, and I will use the drug in first line for most of my patients, but in the situation in which I still consider that patients should receive bevacizumab at the time of progression if they respond to platinum, which is the best predictor of PARP efficacy. I will for sure give the PARP inhibitor according to NOVA and according to Ariel 3, regardless of the raw survival data. Thank you. Frederick, are your views shared? I, I completely agree. So um, it doesn't change um, my clinical practice. And in fact, OS in that population is a very difficult endpoint in a trial that's not powered for it. And it can be confounded by so many factors. But the, the data is supported by time to first and second subsequent therapies, which are also for patients very important um, endpoints. Um, Again, also the the time to give PARP inhibitors is in the first line setting, 
where you have a minimal pretreatment uh, and the least um, disease burden. So you have the, the least chances of, of creating resistance. But maybe coming back to... Sorry? Hey, Frederick, what about retreatments? What about retreating? I was just, I was just coming to that yeah. because that actually opens up the completely... Mm -hmm. uh, the question again of retreatment with PARP inhibitors. And what, what, what uh, from what we learned from Oreo, these patients coming with PARP inhibitors from first line, maybe even with a treatment-free interval, they were absolutely underrepresented in Oreo. So we don't actually have any data for these. I think it was eight, only eight patients altogether in the whole study. So this is something that we should address. And um, for the time being now, we just need to, to use our clinical judgment when to retreat uh, patients. Uh, but I think it is in that setting a far more valid option than we had previously in that term or with that respect, there couldn't be too much learned from that Chinese um, retrospective analysis because all that granularity um, was lacking for that purpose, really. But it's, it's an important question that is becoming more and more important now. And what about um, access to PARP inhibitors? You saw the um, uh, US um, database experience um, of around 10% or so. Um, what, what's your explanation for that? Or in your practices, do you think it may be higher? Um, simple answer from my side, uh, it's, it's far higher. So uh, access and reimbursement isn't an issue here. Uh, I was said? also surprised to see about the, the, I have to say, huge number of patients that does not receive genetic testing in your presentation which is a very odd topic. And uh, yes, for sure, you, you underline that uh, probably one explanation is that the huge number of patients were stage one, two and older patients, but uh, it's important to, to remember it, to underline that BRCA test is not only a predictive test for PARP inhibitor treatment, but that a lot of implication for the prevention of secondary tumors in the patient, but also the prevention of tumors in the rest of the family. So I think that genetic testing actually is mandatory, not only BRCA, but more a more enlarged test, which is HRD. But uh, honestly, we cannot... Uh, preclude our patient the, the possibility to receive this information. But it is important also for us, also in the counseling, the efficacy of PARP is different in BRCA or non-BRCA patient. And this is an information that we need to have because we need to know what kind of patient we are treating. Thank you. So I think what's really clear is that um, we need um, more women to be um, offered testing um, and, and for the oncology community to um, fully understand the uh, relevance of um, the BRCA test and HRD results in guiding treatment and also the implications for our patients. So thank you um, uh, both uh, Professor LaRusso and Professor Mame. Hello, my name is Professor Frederick Mame. I'm an Associate Professor of Gynecology at the Medical Faculty Mannheim at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Now I all, uh, welcome you all back to the third and final section of our series. Um, we will be considering the latest data presented at SGO 2023 on emergent PARP inhibitor-based neoadjuvant and also combination regimens in ovarian cancer. Where are we heading from here? Now, over the last two decades, we really improved our understanding of the genomic landscape uh, and role also of the immune microenvironment. Uh, and that all opens up potential new combination approaches for PARP inhibitors, plus uh, immuno checkpoint inhibitors, but also other combinations. And one of the things that are in focus clearly is that there is a strong rationale to combine PARP inhibitors and immunotherapy, because what's been shown preclinically is that the use of PARP inhibitors sets free small, um, small fragments of double-stranded DNA into the cytosol, where it has actually, via the sting um, gas sting pathway, activates 
a type one uh, interferon response and also the nf kaka uh, activation leading to an influx of um, um, uh, of immune cells into the tumor and preclinically actually part of the uh, part of the um, efficacy of of PARP inhibitors was shown to be linked also to the immune system. And also this um, immune response elicited uh, does actually increase the pdl one expression on the tumor cells. But about from that, there's other ways that might um, open, uh, open opportunities for combinations. Um, for example, if we consider the uh, possible uh, mechanisms of resistance against PARP inhibitors, and there can be direct or indirect restoration of homologous recombination uh, repair. And um, one of the pathways where indirectly HOD is restored, at least partially, is the activation of uh, growth factor signal pathways, including the RAS MAP kinase and MAC pathway. Um, and so we're going to look at two really interesting abstracts presented at this year's SGO both at, as oral presentations and presented by Shannon Weston, Weston, both of them. The first study, called the NOW study, investigated Olaprib in newly diagnosed BRCA mutant ovarian cancer. It's a single arm, open label, label uh, pilot study to determine the feasibility of Olaprib in the neo a neoadjuvant setting for BRCA mutant ovarian cancer. They screened 64 patients, and patients that could be included in the trial had to have a known BRCA1-2 or RAT51CD and or, or PALP2 uh, germline mutation. They must not have had any prior treatment and were, should have been unsuitable for primary debulking surgery, so were planned for neoadjuvant therapy followed by interval um, cytoreductive surgery. The primary, um, primary outcome measures for that study was really feasibility of the laprib in the neoadjuvant setting for BRCA mutant ovarian cancer, defined as unacceptable toxicities or disease progression. And um, as secondary outcomes, they looked at efficacy in terms of response rates and PFS. So out of these 64 patients, about half of them actually were shown to have germline mutations, um, considering all the inclusion and exclusion criteria and some withdrawals, um, they actually managed to include, 15, to include 15 patients into the clinical trial. So these patients were then treated with Olaparib tablets, 300 milligram twice daily for two 28-day cycles. And in, uh, in the case of a response, went to secondary site reduction, uh, and then followed by standard care PACLI and carboplatinum-based chemotherapy and um, PARP inhibitor maintenance in case of response to that. Um, if there was no response or progression, patients would receive carboplatinum paclitaxel-based chemotherapy prior to secondary um, cytoreactive surgery, and then followed by a completion of the uh, first-line chemotherapy and potentially by PARP inhibitor maintenance therapy. For well, the first um, primary endpoint, uh, safety and feasibility, there was only one dose interruption and only one dose reduction in one patient. Most, the most common um, adverse events were abdominal pain and constipation, most likely due to the underlying disease. And um, the only grade three, four um, adverse event reported were in three patients, a grade three anemia um, that makes 20%. In terms of efficacy, 14 of the 15 patients actually underwent surgery. 12 of them had no growth residual disease following surgery, um, corresponding to 85.7%. One patient had a pathologic complete response after only two cycles of olaparib monotherapy. And all patients uh, who underwent secondary site reductive surgery had a residual tumor of less than one centimeter. Uh, also of interest, three patients choose to directly go back to PARP inhibitor maintenance therapy after secondary, um, secondary cytoreductive surgery with no intervening chemotherapy. So three out of these 15s, making uh, it also clear that there is an interest from the patient's side. Um, 
Also, uh, I think something that has to be stressed is the median turnaround time for genetic testing um, results performed on suspicion of ovarian cancer was 10 days. So these patients for that purpose were actually tested when they had suspected ovarian cancer and it was not, um, it was not weighted for the histologic diagnosis, really. The safety profile was as expected for Olaprib in that setting. Um, in terms of responses by RISIS, um, uh, the uh, investigators reported a partial response rate of 53.8% and at a median follow-up of 11.7 months, the 12-month PFS rate was 81%. You have to bear in mind that this is a cohort of patients that were unsuitable for primary debarking surgery. So a uh, prognostic uh, worse cohort of patients, but harboring BRCA mutations. Um, as to the timing of secondary cytoelective surgery following Olaprib, um, most patients, 86%, went into cytoelective surgery immediately after Olaprib. Only one patient had an intervening chemotherapy prior to surgery, and only one patient did not receive any surgery at all. So altogether, the neoadjuvant elaborate was feasible with promising surgical outcomes with only two cycles, even in stage four disease, and an expected safety profile, um, and patients were interested in a PARP therapy only approach as well as documented in that study. The uh, second abstract presented by Shannon Weston as an old presentation was on the SOLAR study. And the SOLAR study was a phase 1b dose expansion study of selumetinib and alaprib in combination um, to observe and record toxicities and activity. Now, selumetinib is a MEK inhibitor, and um, MEK inhibitors are of interest in ovarian cancer for two reasons. For one, um, in low-grade serious ovarian cancer, and this is a subtype that we haven't talked about during our previous discussions so far, um, RAS aberrations, so um, uh, genomic alterations and minimal to uh, MEK inhibitions are really very, very frequent. In addition, also the activation of that growth factor pathway does seem to play a role in um, conferring of inhibitor resistance. And preclinically, really, there is a synergism of Olaprib or PARP inhibitors and MEK inhibitors in ovarian cancer and pancreatic uh, cancer um, models. So this study uh, recruited 74 patients with either RAS aberrant ovarian cancer, RAS aberrant endometrial cancer, or RAS aberrant solid tumors, or another cohort with ovarian cancer after progression on a PARP inhibitor, regardless of their genomic RAS uh, alteration status. It was um, unlimited prior therapies were allowed, but patients were not allowed to have um, a prior MEK inhibitor. So these patients received Olaprib at a dose of 300 milligrams twice daily and silimetinib at 75 milligrams twice daily. Um, first of all, the toxicity, was the primary outcome measure as well as the overall response rate. For the safety profile, looking at the um, safety uh, cohort, the most common AEs really were nausea, fatigue, and anemia, something that we would expect from a part in HARP inhibitor. Um, the most common AEs, grade three, four, were anemia, fatigue, acne, form rash, which is rather due to the MEK inhibitor, and neutropenia may be due to both or and the combination. Um, dose interruptions occurred in um, about 60% of the patients, dose reduction in 34%, and dose discontinuations um, or discontinuations in 8%. Turning to the response to therapy, and dissecting the ovarian cancer cohorts into the RAS aberrant, and the PARP inhibitor resistance, there was a clinical benefit rate of 69% in these heavily pretreated RAS aberrant ovarian cancers with a partial response rate of 32%. In the PARP inhibitor resistant population, so that 12 of the patients, 
clinical benefit rate was 42%, and there still was an overall response rate with partial responses in 17% of the patients. Now, of the 19 patients with breast aberrant ovarian cancer, nine were actually low-grade serious ovarian cancer, and for those, the clinical benefit rate was even a slightly higher uh, with 77% and a partial response rate of 44%. Along these lines of combination of therapy, we are currently awaiting the um, results of several phase uh, three trials uh, combining PARP inhibitors with immunotherapy. Uh, most of them are expected to report this year or next year. We have seen the press release for the duo study. Um, so we have combinations of different PARP inhibitors with different uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, some of them also uh, allowing bevacizumab or giving bevacizumab mandate freely. Um, also, other combinations uh, like the combinations of niraparib and an antiadrogenic TKA and, and lotinib are on the way and also of interest with respect to the neoadjuvant olaparib data that was presented in the NOW trial. Um, there is a phase two study on niraparib versus um, a platinum-based doublet chemotherapy as neoadjuvant treatment. Um, which uh, which is running currently and will be presenting data in three years' time. So this concludes my review of the data of these two interesting um, uh, abstracts presented at this year's SGO. And I would like now like to open up the discussion to our panel and welcome back to my co-faculty uh, members, uh, Keta LaRusso and Susanna Banerjee. Um, I don't know what you made of these two abstracts. I found them really interesting. Um, and I'd like to discuss with you if you see if there's any, um, any, any role potentially in a clinical practice for any of these approaches, really. Maybe, Susanna, if you want to start. Sure. I think the first thing it should is that these, um, uh, these studies, and we congratulate um, Shannon Weston uh, and the team for the work, um, is the value of um, smaller hypothesis generating studies based on biology. Um, and um, it is it can be incredibly challenging to um, get, get these studies started and delivered, but they're very valuable um, for um, the results that you presented today and also to guide future clinical trial development. I think with the... Um, Second abstract, um, as you know, I have an interest in in the in MEK inhibitors. Um, I think it really shows the importance of um, targeted therapy according to molecular profile. Um, so the significance of um, RAS uh, aberrations um, and the potential response one can have with MEK inhibitors, and you've highlighted low-grade serous ovarian cancer. Um, uh, and the first abstract that you mentioned with regards to upfront PARP inhibitors, um, I think it's important to know that this is feasible. I'd be very interested to know about um, the outcome of the, I think it was one patient that um, didn't go ahead with surgery um, and did they subsequently um, receive carboplatin, for example, and what was the um, uh, response to, to carboplatin? Um, as as we've um, uh, discussed before, um, that um, platinum for BRCA mutated patients is also a very good agent. So it's really about is the efficacy superseding um, carboplatin and paclitaxel, and of course we need to balance side effects as well. Oh, oh sure, Susie, and and if I, if I can comment. Um, there is another aspect, in my opinion, that should be considered with caution uh, when we speak about new adjuvant PARP inhibitor. I mean the potential cross-resistant with platinum. And uh, the worst thing we can do is to induce uh, cross-resistance in first line. And if we use PARP inhibitor in new adjuvant setting, we cannot be sure with the data we have now that we could not impact potentially on subsequent uh, PARP efficacy, platinum efficacy. And uh, this is the worst thing we can do. 
So in my opinion, uh, uh, yes, for sure, the, the study you shall demonstrate it's feasible, but uh, not sure that is the way to, to, to proceed, to be honest. I think that uh, platinum uh, should maintain a rule in the treatment of BRCA mute patients because BRCA mute patients, by definition, are platinum sensitive. And uh, I think that uh, I would not risk cross resistant with platinum by using PARP in the new adjuvant setting. While I find. I... Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go I... on. No, no, just to say that uh, it was very interesting for me the combination with MEC inhibitor. Uh, because MEK inhibitor are not easy to combine drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, PARP inhibitor may have some problem of um, toxicity also. So uh, it was very interesting to me uh, to see the combo is feasible, but also the, the benefit rate more than 70%. It's, it's, it's very impressive. And the, the idea is to transform low grade serious tumor that by according to definition does not potentially respond to platinum but with this combo seems to benefit so we are transforming a genomic stable tumor in a genomic unstable tumor this is the advantage of the combo and in this setting it seems very very promising i find very interesting that that uh, trial I, I agree. So the, the response rate for the combination also in the low-grade series seems higher than what we've seen from the trametinib trial and other trials. Um, ob obviously, we don't know what the contribution of either of these drugs really is. And I think this is, this is the, uh, the task that we have to, or the, the, the question that we have to answer in, in the future. Maybe coming back to, to shortly coming back to the neoadjuvant study, I think in fact, um, platinum-based therapy is such a strong standard and it's well tolerated in most, most patients. Um, and it, it is sort of an addition to the whole spectrum. We're not going to give up on that. I think for me, two aspects are, are of interest. And, and one of them is, and this is why we're currently also running a trial recruiting as a window of opportunity. The way that we use PARP inhibitors nowadays in the first line setting mostly is as a black box because patients had surgery and chemotherapy, there's nothing to measure. So there's very difficult to really directly measure response to, to these PARP inhibitors and maybe a shorter duration of therapy and novel technologies to measure response like circulating tumor DNA would offer a chance in a treatment naive patient to see activity of a single agent PARP inhibitor. I think this is something that's interesting. And also it clearly shows the activity of these agents in that setting. And I think if we think about early, early ovarian cancer, where we've got little, little data um, and we, we, where we don't have any, any um, indication or label for PARP inhibitors, but high grade serious stage, you know, 1C or 2, 2B or whatever, we feel tempted to use it. And maybe this is rather the space where there is some opportunity for de-escalation, de-escalating chemotherapy, maybe replacing it by a PARP inhibitor to give it for a longer therapy. So with, with that comment, I really want to thank you both for this very, very engaged and interesting discussion on these two very uh, important um, an interesting abstract, and I also want to um, thank the audience for their attention. And I can all only invite you to also watch or listen to the uh, to other episodes of this series um, on data from the ESGO to, uh, 2023. Thank you so much.